they said we want a man's uh, perspective. So I accepted to come. Just unfortunately, my very good friend, who is also my um, uh, uh, inspirational buddy, couldn't come. So if I'm not able to speak well, don't blame me. Uh, blame uh, Mr. Jabel Ochre for not being here. The wife is here, but the, the man is my, is my thing. Um, you know, at times I, I listen to people and, um, in my practice, and uh, they come up with statements like, um, without a, a man, a woman cannot be anything. You know, I keep on hearing that a lot. You know, and uh, I, 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 I will say something, and uh, I think that rather is the opposite that a man cannot be his fullness or his full potential, cannot attain his full potential without a woman. And why do I say that? I say that. I'm a motivational speaker, but I take my motivation from the scriptures. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you from the scriptures. I'm not going to preach, but I'm going to talk to you from the scriptures. I say that because of one particular verse and one particular word in that verse. That's in the book of Genesis when um, uh, uh, God said, it is not good for man to be alone. He said that I'll make for him a helper and that word helper uh, is not like somebody who is trying to help somebody who is doing something and let me just come alongside and help you do it that word helper when we look in the hebrew is talking about it's mostly used for god helping israel god helping israel and when god is helping israel it means that Israel cannot help themselves. They get to a place where it is tough, it is difficult, they don't have what it takes to make it anymore. And then God comes in and helps them to make it. Is that type of, is that side of God that he used to make the woman. So the woman has what people or others don't have, especially men, but they need in order to make it. Are you with me? Yes. So, when she has the inbuilt, created ability of God to address every situation, bring solution, and see that people go through, supply everything that is needed, to be able to make it. So basically, that God nature is that which God made a woman with. Incidentally, <laughs> incidentally, when you read the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, that same word, helper, is the same Greek word that Jesus used for the Holy Spirit, paraclete. So both the Old Testament Hebrew and the Greek Old Testament give that aspect of God to the woman. That without you, and this is something I believe, without a woman, no individual can really attain your maximum potential. It's something you were made with. It's something that God created you with. But I'm not only talking about helping others. Now, God as a helper, whether there is somebody to help or not, he has that ability within him. So you as a woman, whether there is somebody there to help or not, in you is that inbuilt ability 
to come up with solutions. So in yourself, you should be able to rise up above every situation and become what you were made to be. One thing I've seen in my practice is that because of their belief system, what they believe about themselves, and people tell them when they are growing up, they, they, they tend to have that belief that I'm not able, I'm not able, I'm not able. Tonight I want to challenge your belief system. I want to challenge what you think about yourself. I want to challenge how you see yourself. How you perceive your ability to rise up above every situation and become what you were created to be. Because if you are not able to do it to yourself, you can't help anybody become what they have to be. It first starts with you. Seeing yourself as having the fullness so as the cost of change. And you will always change for the better. You have it within you. As a woman, you were created to overcome every adversity. So when you live here, face tomorrow and the days to come with such strength and such mental capability and it shall be well with you. God bless you. Thank you. Mr. Dodu, I think we need to have a men's conference about empowering women and I think Dr. Oka needs to be the speaker because it is a beautiful thing to have your partner your life partner encourage you, motivate you, push you, know when to say, go ahead, Diana, and also know when to back off and say, I'm just gonna give Diana some time, maybe, you know, she needs it. It's not always, as the men of the family and the head of the family, especially in our Ghanaian culture, we, we have separation of roles. But when it comes to empowering, when it comes to nurturing, there is no separation of roles. It shouldn't always be the wife comforting, soothing, nurturing. The husband should also be able to comfort, soothe, and nurture. And in my husband, this is what I say to him when we were getting married, I said, you have to treat me like an egg, an uncooked egg. You have to be very gentle with me because with any quite a little move, I can crack. <laughs> And I want to be stable and whole. And as we continue this life journey, it's like he's putting me in hot water and I'm boiling, right? Because then I, I become stronger. I become more whole. So when adversity comes, because I have a good support system, even if they drop me and I crack, I'm still okay, right? But if you don't have a good person to place you nicely in that boiled water, you're already cracked before you get in that water. And then it's boiling and the egg is all over the place. But when you have a good strong man behind you, there's nothing you can't do. And even when you do it, you're like, baby, it's okay, I wanna do this, I wanna do that, what do you think? And then she's always coming to you, not because she can't think on her own. You've set a place and a table where she's comfortable to come to you. And she wants your opinion and wants your advice and wants to hear from you. So doctor, thank you so much for opening our minds today. And I'm gonna push for Mr. Duodu to have this empowerment conference. Women won't be invited. We will just wait for the aftermath and enjoy it in our home, amen? For all women, we need our husbands to empower us just a little bit more so we can be that much better. So as we eat. Yes, you've done very well. Please give yourselves a big round of applause. The DJ is gonna put on some nice music. I'm gonna come around. So this table is gonna go first. But nana no Mr. Ramunidi, Mumudi, Montanasi, Ebesa, Mumawai. Um, and yes, I'm going to be special. But so I'm going to be a special. And then I'm going to be a special.
in Toman and Copia, so you are seven of Bawanya Nessa, the car culture on Bawanya. In tea, I'm going to call the tables and we're going to go around nice and smoothly, get our food. The food is done by the one and only Chef Loso. Now, this young man is a talent. A talent. He has a knack for taste combinations. Your flavor and your buds will be going wild today, so prepare yourself to eat. Yes, you've done very well. Please give yourselves a big round of applause. The DJ is going to put on some nice music. I'm going to come around. So this table is going to go first, but no, 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 Mr. Amunidia, Mumudia, Montanasi, I best say, I'm away. Um, and yes, I'm going to be special, but so I'm going to be a little bit of a And then I'm going to be a fra. And tomorrow, I'm going to be a little bit of a fra. So I'm going to be a little bit of a fra. In tea, I'm going to call the tables and we're going to go around nice and smoothly, get our food. The food is done by the one and only Chef Loso. Now, this young man is a talent. A talent. He has a knack for taste combinations. Your flavor and your buds will be going wild today. So prepare yourself. Please, we are continuing to sell raffle tickets. I told you, you win that air fryer, your husband will be making you chicken. So it's free for $10 and $7 to win. So if you want to win the raffle ticket, so please, 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 everybody, reach into your wallets, your purses. No amount is too small. This all goes to the betterment of the Ghanaian Canadian Association and our goal to better empower our community. Thank you so much. I'll be coming around. Whoa, heavy. And you know he's a very smart man. He, he, he surrounds himself with some powerful ladies. All right, I'm going to pass it to you, Mr. Jordan. Here you go, sir. Thank you very much, and I think very easy as well. So, yeah. So, I think, you know, standing here with two women, one man right on left, that shows that really, you know, our organization cannot thrive without women in the community. And, and to me, the women wing, you know, be small and be um, what kind you guys can do amazing. You know, so thank you for all the great work. And, you know, um, you know, I've been so inspired by what I've heard today, really. And, and I don't want to uh, bore you with a lot of talk. But what I want to say is that, um, just for me, I, I have two girls. And with my wife, so I'm the minority. So <laughs> that shows that I have three powerful women at home. And they keep me grounded. In fact, without them, I wouldn't even be able to do what I'm doing. So that's a testament to you know, what women provide or what they do in the community. And, and in fact, my right is my uh, vice president. It's my other vice president. They, they are amazing as well. I want to thank them, these young women. They do great work for the community. So, so thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I, I just want to say one thing quickly, and that, you know, when I look at women, Sometimes I was working and somebody was telling me that Look, you Africans, you don't respect women. <laughs> and that really, and, and I said, what do you mean by that? You say, you men, the men in Africa are macho men. That's the way he put it. And I tried to defend it in a way, but he gave examples here and there. But on one hand, I think I was struck by something, something that tells me that, you know, when the Ashantis were going to war in 1900, was one day they call the asset to work, who stood up. And I, I just got that inkling, I need to tell that story. And the mom would say, wow. And I said, yeah. And I said, let's look at the picture. I said, you can Google it. And that was in 1900. What a long time. Um, a woman, maybe not only in our community, but here. There is a woman, you guys might know her name, uh, Helen Taylor. She was disabled. Even in our culture, when we are trying to install a country, it's the queen mother who decides. So all the women over here, I want you to know that you have a special place in our community. You are queen and princesses. I want you to know that. We adore you because when you come to the table, in whatever we do, you simplify things, you make things happen. 
you are resilient and you are amazing. And the women wing, I want you to know that our community wouldn't strive without you at all. You, I, I always quote that, you know, on the Mother's Day, every year I quote it, I said, you are the, you know, you are going to continue soaring and be our backbone in the community. And I know you will help us to move our community forward. And, and I've heard a lot of powerful, uh, Marilyn, you did that amazing. Easier, uh, Diana Jason, you guys are amazing. A lot of people and those who spoke, you've been incredible. So uh, I want to leave on a note that our community is on good grounds. Um, we stand on the shoulders of people who built this, who started this community. But we've building on it. It started in 1970s, and we are just you know continuing that journey. One day I will not be here. Juliet might not be there. Mary might not be the best, other people, leaders will come up. That is what happens. But tonight, I want to thank you, our uh, women, we continue to do what you're doing. You guys are amazing. And the women in our community, please join, tell your friends, numbers come. If we can build a strong women group, then the sky is the limit for our community. So continue sorry. I know some of the stories even we're talking about it on the table, but sometimes women, we don't do a lot of work. I brought my men's wing leader here. I don't know whether he's here. He's still here. Uh, Annalise from Bonner, have you left? No, he's not right there. So Annalise says he's here taking notes because it's going to have a men's event. I think Diana. So it's going to happen. And when that happens, that day, the women will sit in the back and we'll get by the men. That's what we'll do. So thank you very much. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Thank you so much, President. Please give him a big round of applause. Thank you so much. He embodies the empowerment of women, the development, the growth, the stabilizing, ensuring that gaps are being filled, ensuring that we have a voice, ensuring that we are heard, ensuring that we're seen, not just within our communities and outside our communities. And Dr. Sylvia Bawa is doing that and has done that and continues to do it. As an associate professor of sociology at York University, and also currently the director of the Resource Center for, for Public Sociology. She's a global sociologist with expertise in human rights, development, and post-colonial feminism. Her work on human rights is aimed to unraveling, is aimed at unraveling structural inequities inequalities found in the conceptions of empowerment. So she sort of, she's starting from the ground up. She doesn't want the, it to be established and then we're trying to figure out, and I feel like that's what companies are doing with us today. Dr. Sylvia Bawa, thank you so much. Thank you so much um, for that uh, very kind and long introduction. Um, this is usually not where I do my lectures, so I'm a bit out of my debt. So let me start um, by observing protocol. So Madam President, I know we clapped a little when she was introduced, but I would really like another round of applause for all the work that she does. Um, I know that it's not easy to organize anyone, let alone a big group of people like this with diverse interests, with ideas from here to the uh, bottom of the world and back again. So I think that is fantastic work. Uh, Mr. President of the GCAO, fellow panelists, fellow distinguished women especially, and other guests, including, of course, the few men that we have in our midst. Ye Anola, Zanyore, Ye Baraka Yagaza, and for those of you, and I think most of you speak Chi, Ye Mamwa Jo, I think I got that right. I will begin with a story. I like stories, and I think in our culture, that is one of the ways we learn things. Was we've heard a lot, we've heard so many things, and I was so glad that we also did the breathing exercises that kind of helped to settle us. Once there was a great famine in Badari land. Everything was dying. The animals had started to die, the crops were dying because there was no rain, 
and people were beginning slowly to starve to death. The despair, as you can imagine, was unimaginable. They had prayed, they had poured libation, and they had done everything they could, and yet it seemed that they were destined to die. They had gone out king. One evening, a fire was spotted somewhere in one of the houses towards the outskirts of town. Soon, there were whispers that steam from cooking pots were visible. Soon after, it was confirmed that indeed someone was cooking food. Baffled, the villagers wondered who could have been cooking anything in the midst of such great famine. Later on, they started to hear rumors that it was indeed not just cooking food, that it was a feast. So as you can imagine, everyone started to gather around this one last bit of hope. When they got there, Vialoma, who had started this feast, came out, welcomed everyone with a smile and said, I am indeed making a feast for everyone, but I'm going to need some help. And so, anyone who can bring any ingredient, gather and bring them. Soon enough, they indeed had a feast cooking in a pot that was otherwise only cooking stones. <laughs> I will tell you another story. There was a flood once in the animal kingdom. The monkeys were quite unaffected because they could climb atop the tree tops. So as they sat there, they looked down and saw fishes submerged in water. Very quickly, our dear monkeys decided to hatch up a rescue plan, and they did. And they decided to go down into the waters to rescue the fishes. Of course, they placed them on dry ground. The fishes wriggled to death. The monkeys went back up on their treetops and said, oh, such ungrateful fishes. They couldn't even say thank you before taking their naps. We all know that those fishes were not taking naps. They were dead. I will try to tie all these stories together at the end, or I will leave you to figure out what they have to do with empowerment and collective power. Today, I'm glad that I'm the last to speak. Initially, I was wondering if I would only speak for two minutes because I noticed that we were all hungry, and I was like, how smart. They decided that when you're giving a mic to an academic, give them time so that you actually give them a short deadline and they won't bore anyone else to death. Um, but I will try to respect the, the short time that I have in part because I too would like to dance. So one of the things that I would like us to talk about, our people, the Dagaba people say something that is fantastic. And they say that Anyone here? You can do everything you want when you go to negotiate. You still have to pay for that good. It doesn't matter. So I'll leave you with just a few short points because I am at risk of repeating myself. And I would introduce myself as someone who has two children, so I'm a mother, which is fantastic. But when I look out in this room today, I want to introduce myself as a daughter because I see my mothers in this room and I cannot but acknowledge the work that you have done to put me here as a professor at York University. I say this as a mother of, uh, as a, a daughter of a nurse who had a side hustle selling pito and selling cloth. Yeah. So when you talked about Intuma or Waja, as we used to call it, at a very early age, I knew how to keep records. Who was buying what, when were they paying their little money, what susu was coming into the house. And finally, in while when we had electricity, I helped my mother with yet another side hustle, selling iced water and ice block in war market. So, and one of the things that I've also noticed, and I know that 
We talk a lot about attitudinal change and growing generational wealth. This is our risk averse, but I'm no longer risk averse. Thank you, Marilyn, for that. But for those of us who are also just risk averse, um, you know, there's no point in trying to pretend that you are not risk averse, right? And I know that. But of course, it is in knowing yourself, in knowing your background, and in knowing what cushion will hold you when you fall. And I think that is also part of you know, um, this whole thing. A few short points, as I said. Light fires. Light fires, like the aloma. When all hope seems lost, be that person like Auntie May, who always just smiles. She brightens the room when you meet her and she's like, oh my God, you're from Ghana. I think that was when we met somewhere in Toronto at a museum or something of that sort. Be like um, Yvonne Ayelizono, who would just say, oh my daughter, oh my sister, how are you doing? Little things like that is lighting a fire. And I think many of you do it even without realizing. Sometimes just being in a space, and I applaud those of you who wear Ghanaian clothing to many places. Because there are times when you can be feeling so down, and especially when you are in a room full of um, white people or grody people who don't understand anything you are about to say and you walk into that room and you see that one person and you smile and you say, I'm glad you are here. Yes. Right? And I know what that feels like because I did my PhD at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. Yes, right? I'm hearing that. If you don't know what it is like to be a black person in a small university town, try Kingston. Um, you'll be nodding at every person of color, not just black people. So when I got my job at York University, imagine I had arrived, country miles in town. I was like seeing every person, black person, and nodding, and nodding, and I'm sure people were like, what's wrong with her? Of course, Toronto, we take it for granted, right? But what I'm trying to say is light fires where there is despair, even when you don't have it all together. And I think we've heard it today, time and again from Marilyn. Like, I don't think you knew where your campaign would go when you started, but you were like, I will do this. And because you have done this, there will be another young Ghanaian woman, another young African woman who says, she's done it, now there's a blueprint, and I'm going to build on that. So I think that that is one of the things that we can also do. Or just be that person that listens and smiles. And I have many aunties that do that. And then they don't say anything to you after that. They're just like, okay, okay. The second thing I'd like to leave you with, of course, is know yourself. And I think this is basic enough. But I think it's one thing that we keep having to learn about ourselves. I knew myself as a daughter, as an auntie, and then when I had children, I had to know myself as a mother. And I think many of us go through those kinds of iterations in our lives. And now I realize that I actually like to eat alone very slowly after everyone has gone to bed. Because I don't want to hear anyone say, mommy this, mommy that. I'm just like, no, I'm eating my food when you are asleep. It could be that you really love to dance, but you're shy, right? We have to learn to also spark joy in our lives because do whatever we like. If we don't seem joyful, our children will not want to become Marilyn. They will not, you, but, you know, they would not like to do some of the community service work that we do because they're like, oh my God, I don't want to be like my mom. What is that? And I know many of you also have kids or people who don't even want to get married. <laughs> you wonder why, right? And I think those are also some of the things we need to do. We need to demystify marriage. We need to say it sucks. We need to say it's a growing thing. We need to say especially that a lot of us are not actually prepared about marriage and we need to tell our daughters especially that it is okay to walk away, yes. right? That it is okay to walk away. I think that's also a risk 
because then God challenges our men to do better because we know that they can be better. Right? Um, so I'm going to... Um, see, this is why we invited the men. <laughs> so that you can tell your fellow men that we are tired and that we don't want our children to be tired and that if you don't do better, we are going to go and leave you alone. <laughs> yeah, seriously, too. Another thing that I, I want us to talk about is also how to empower our allies, our men folk. We have all these fabulous workshops. Sometimes I wish they could attend all the workshops that we, the men's groups put, put out about gender-based violence, about all these things. And the women have the knowledge, they have the power. And then you have to now go and start baby steps. Be like A, B, when we are already reading at grade four level. Right? So I think we need to take those kinds of things seriously. And it's not just the men. We have to empower men for our young ladies. We want our young ladies to be married to men who roll out the red carpet in every way for them. We want these young ladies to feel romantic love from black men without saying, hey, did you make the fufu today? <laughs> serious. You know? like that. And I think we need to also engage the youth and be ready to listen to them. Their ideas seem preposterous, but so were your ideas when you were speaking to your mothers and thinking you knew it all. But here you are. You've made it. And I think when I talk about empowering our allies, it's not just the men. We also live in a Canadian society. We live in a society where racism is real. We need to hear and hear ourselves, our children, when they are talking about their experiences with racism. And wherever we find ourselves, we need to do that job. And in talking about racism, one of the misconceptions about African women, and I'm sure many of you have encountered that, is that we are docile, we are mistreated, and that we are just so poverty ridden. And I think when you've been in any other circles and people look at you and you say something, they're like, oh, but you sound so articulate. And you just want to slap the person. You're know, like, hmm. I wonder where those ideas come from. I think we have to begin to educate people about their ideas about Africa. They think oh, that we are the cradle of humanity. We have ideas. Yes, we have been oppressed. But we are rising and they need to be ready for us. Finally, my last point, and I'm always carrying this thing like a badge of honor, is decolonize. We have to decolonize. Emancipate yourselves from mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our minds. Have no fear for atomic energy. None of them can stop the time. How long shall they kill our prophets while we stand aside and look? Some say it's just a part of it. We've got to fulfill the books. Won't you help to sing? The song of freedom, it's all I ever have, redemption song. I did not know that all these people who wake up and do fajiri, morning prayers, that is, and all the real secret of Mali fans. <laughs> Decolonizing, one of the things, and I think um, others have alluded to that, is that we come from a place, we come from a culture that was severely colonized, and that has affected all of us. Scholars actually call this the coloniality of our being. That in some ways, we all have these colonial ideas about what is better. And Marilyn, Portia talked about that. 
We do not think that the Ghanaian person, the African person, is the person to speak to about wealth management because we think that Ansala is the one with the ideas, right? And we see this, and it is especially more shameful when we go back home, when people just think that it is the ideas of the West. Kwame Nkrumah talked about this, that the last stage of colonization is neocolonialism. And part of that has to do with our own mindset. So whenever we are forced to say, well, as for Africa, dear, as for our own people, dear, think about it. These are sometimes human problems we are speaking about. And the only way any group of people has changed is through accountability. Being able to hold people accountable at the home level, at any level, government, whatever, and say, hey, this is our money. Just like we think about land at home, we say that land does not belong to the present generation. Land belongs to the future generations, the yet unborn. So what are we doing with our own land? And I was so glad when Mays in, in the in Auntie Mays land acknowledgement, she talked about the indigenous people who are the landowners of this land that we stand on today, who were dispossessed just as we've been dispossessed. And not just through our natural resources, but also our mental resources. Many of us are here because we run away. And for a lot of us women, we are only able to thrive when we are not where anyone tells us culture says you should not do this. So we come to places where we are more accepted, where we are part of a collective, not just a collective of Ghanaian women, but also a collective of other oppressed groups. And part of this is solidarity. Today we are speaking about all kinds of issues igniting our collective power. And we always have to remember that our sisters, the indigenous women of this country, are also our sisters because we are going nowhere fast if they are going nowhere. We also have other struggles, our sisters who were stolen from us through colonization, and again, that was in Antine's um, acknowledgement. They are our siblings who are scattered all over the diasporas. They may have been, they may be living in Nova Scotia, they may be in the United States, but they are our siblings. And we have to remember that these and our children, the young ones, are out there saying black lives matter. Don't say, hey, come and sit at home. Don't be risk averse about it because they are fighting for a better world for all of us. Like I said in the beginning, um, um, long talk does not buy a good. <laughs> and the Chinese people actually also say that a wise person plants a tree while knowing that they will never sit under that tree. And it is because of that that I am so grateful for the work the GCAO is doing by trying to establish a hub. So if you haven't made your widow's might contribution, and I know you are thinking about it, please make it. Because at some point, that is the tree that this generation of Ghanaians are trying to build for people who are going to come after us. And so decolonization is also about imagining possibilities that were not national musician. Um, and one of her songs says, Tinamba yi, Tinamba wa, Tinamba se kono. To which it means we have not yet even emerged and people are afraid. And there are so many barriers because people fear the firepower that we are coming with. But then as Willala reminds us, we have to roar. Thank you very much for indulging me. So Dr. Bauer said a lot. She said a lot. I don't know if that's a good idea, but I'll try a little bit. 
Hi, my name is Lucy. I run the car construction team, real estate. Sorry, I'm not coming to sell anything. <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> well, everyone, good evening. And I just want to thank the DCAO. Did not plan, or I don't even know. And asked me, what are you going to talk about? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> but I'm going to talk about something. Um, how did around the car construction team came about? Let's backtrack. So again, my name is Lucy Che. Che. Sometimes open saw bro flies and I say, my name is Lucy Kai. My name is Lucy Che. Um, I know I roughly I'm saying Kai, but then get Kai A Che. I actually came to Canada when I was about 19, 20, and as a child, I wanted to be air hostess. I think back in Ghana we call it air hostess, but it's flight attendant if you want to be Canadianized. So yeah, and you know the Bible says, "For so I know the plans I have for you." Jeremiah twenty nine eleven. I, as a child, imagined being a hostess or flight attendant because my dad was a firefighter. I grew up around airport residential and I see all these air hostess with their high heels and their bags and they look so good. So I was like, that's what I want to be. But God has another plan. So I came to Canada and I realized that that dream was not going to happen. And so I have to think of another plan. But again, God is in control. So he started with me by working in the factory, um, doing a whole bunch of work, including cleaning. I have done cleaning a lot. I know how to use those buffing big machines. Um, that, it didn't end there. And then God moved me again to a factory where they were um, sewing clothing like medicine in Hamilton. But fortunately for me, before I left Ghana, because I couldn't go to school to become flight attendant, my parents um, put me through um, when the trade school or commercial school where I learned sewing. I think our sister they talk about uh, you know having some side jobs or learning other trade work. So I actually was a seamstress in Ghana before coming to Canada. So when I came here, it became handy. I was able to get this job and it was well paying. Shortly I got married and had three kids and everything kind of like, you know, changed. While raising three kids, things didn't work as planned. Sometimes, you know, the marriage doesn't work and then you move on. So with my three kids, I decided what is next. I'm going to put myself through school. I did go to school. How did I go to school? Somebody I met while I was being volunteering in a shelter said, I love the way you are with your kids. I think you'll be a great EC. So why don't you take the course? And so again, God was directing my path because he knew what he has planned for me. I did listen to that advice. I went to George Brown for three years, two years as an EC, and the final year was becoming a daycare manager. So I did get all this certification. I worked 26 years as an EC. God, again, was so good. While I was doing that work, one of my students, who was about six, seven, there were two sisters, their dad came to me one day and he said, hey, Lucy, Take my business card, I'm a real estate agent. If you know anybody who wants to buy, just hook me up. And so I became interested in like, real estate agent, what do you do? As I was doing inquiries, I was like, oh, I want to do that, real estate agent. So that dream um, sat with me, and I started looking into how I could become a real estate agent while I was teaching. And this guy became almost like a destiny helper. He answered all my questions and said, I could help you buy your first house when you're ready. So now the calculation started going. How are you going to get money? 
as um, a single parent and buy a house. At that time, I was living in a neighborhood where I was paying um, subsidized accommodation. When I graduated from school, I got a full-time job, and the manager said, you're making so much money, we're going to increase your rent. And when I look at the rent and the mortgage, the difference was very little. So what I decided to do is, if that's the case, I'm going to buy a house. And then, is that right? 2000. So that was like 23 years ago. And the joke is, when the guy brought me to Brampton, because he knows I couldn't afford anything in, in Toronto, it was very small. Brampton was very tiny and very dark. And when I was shopping around with this guy and my kids, my kids said, Mommy, there are no black people here. Everything you want to stay here. Let's go back to Toronto. So we kept coming to Brampton because the guy said, if you could move to Brampton, it would be good for you with your income and how much you could afford. Lo and behold, one day, we did see all these small dark skin kids on the bike. And that community was like 90% white neighborhood and the importance of generational wealth. So I decided I'm going to restrict myself um, from unnecessary spending. And I call it that way, that's my story. I wanted to refrain from things that is not gonna help me because I wanted to, 20 years down the line, be financially free. So, as I invested in that property, I said to myself, any money that comes into my hands, I'm going to put it into the mortgage. Hopefully, one day, it's going to yield some profit. And 26 years later, I have been flipping and flipping and flipping. I never gave up on that real estate dream that as we speak, I am at Hamburg College taking the real estate course to be certified so I can actually practice as a certified agent. Even though I've been working for so many years and I know inside and outside of real estate, I want to be professionally certified. So what happened to the EC? 26 years later, I decided to retire for two or three reasons. I am no longer teaching as an EC, but I am pursuing this real estate career. Last year, I went to Ghana to visit my family. When I went to Ghana, I noticed that a lot of our young guys are working so hard in the construction field and they're being paid very little or they have no job. So I connected with a friend of mine who's an architect. He builds a lot, he develops community, and I said, listen, I am taking the course, I am interested in becoming a real estate um, agent, both in Ghana and Canada. So I want to team up with you. He took me in, and I've been working alongside of this gentleman. So before coming, eight, eight months in Ghana, I started my own business called Around the Clock Construction Team Real Estate. And that's how that, that, that birth was given, or that's how I gave birth to that Around the Clock. So if you see Around the Clock Construction Real Estate, I am not professionally practicing, and I won't say I am certified agent. However, I know the work for the last 20 years, and I've helped my case Throughout that one um, purchase, all my three kids have bought their own property and everybody has moved out. So don't um, think real estate is not a good thing. If you can, just, you know, learn to do little investment. That's why I'm going to say that when you have any money that you feel is not going to do anything right there, then invest it somewhere if you can team up of Sister Rafi and Marilyn, yeah. or my daughter here, or team up with me and we'll do real estate together. So I just want to encourage everybody that, you know, um, a little bit counts. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter your status. You know, you need to be single 
and do something for yourself. You just have to acknowledge whatever challenge comes into your life. Sometimes challenges come to prepare us to be something better. Don't run away from challenge and don't run away from change. Changing is difficult, but it's always very good, no matter what the situation is. If you believe in God and you know God has a plan for you, then allow God to do his thing at his own time. Thank you so much. Thank you. You guys can be way better than that. Thank you so much. I'm not going to come for anything but to teach me how to get my kids out the house and to, for them to get their own houses. Now that is a goal. Because usually, you know, you have kids and one does well or two. Wait, you're lucky when all of them? So I can Lucy, we're going to come. We're going to come for some training. The raffle tickets. If you haven't bought your tickets, last chance to get it. They're going to be positive and very happy when Diana wins. And then we're going to call um, Mrs. Liz O'Kine to come and talk to us briefly and DJ Ice on the ones and twos. Are we ready with the raffle? Are we ready with the draws? Tickets. Tickets in four. Is everybody here? We're here. The tickets are Beautiful, ready. talented, intelligent, well-spoken, fashionably inclined. Yes. The fabulous lady who does it and does it so effortlessly. She will tell you when there's a red light situation that you need to move from. She will help you understand. Let me, let me hug you. I love you too. <laughs> Thank you so much. I love you too. Thank you very much for your kind words. Um, what can I say? Who can follow that? There's nothing else to say but to acknowledge all of you. You look so beautiful from this point of view. If you want, if you think I'm lying, one of you come up here and see. All of you look amazing. And thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Um, when we started planning this, you know what? Um, it only takes a great leader. And I won't take the credit at all. I've been called upon to say a few words. I don't want to call it closing remarks because it's going to be dancing. Mm -hmm. um, but we want to you know, get off all the, the talking and then we can just dance the night away. Um, so I just wanted to um, acknowledge our leader, Maud. Please give it up for this great, amazing, and, you know, toward woman. She likes to hide, but we want to eliminate her. We want to shine the light on her because she's such a great leader. And when things go well, you can know for sure that there is a good leader behind all of us. You know what, we sometimes take the mic and we stand here and we talk, but their ideas, Madam, oh, hello. Oh, that's a new person if you will. And then the ideas start. One to the next, to the next, and then we come up with something like this. But we cannot do this without a strong committee of 26. A strong women committee of 26. We meet, we were meeting weekly, weekly on Wednesday nights, no break. Trust me, I'm in the shower, we're meeting. I'm, I'm sleeping. I'm not well, we're meeting. Miss Maud is like, we're meeting. And uh, we've been meeting and look at what has happened. I know that this is the only second one that we're putting on but it's just gonna get bigger and better. And thank you all so much for coming. We thank our GCAO leadership here, and we know that they have our backs, you know. They do all the accounting, and they give us the money, and they, they give us the resources to be able to put something like that on, and we're so grateful. We are most grateful to all the women who were able to make it today, and we hope that whenever we put on something, when you hear the word conference, please, you know, we were trying to change up the word and add dinner dance to it. Look at the speakers that we had today. Did you hear Dr. Bauer speak? Did you hear Marilyn speak? And Portia who left? Like, who, who would want to miss this? When we invite you or we tell you there's going to be a program, trust us. When we say conference, let's start at 10 a.m. and let's get out of here. Let's come to a real conference next time. And let's get out of here. And then when we have parties, we have parties. We don't have to mix them. You know, you know why we mix them up? Because you might not come. That's not good. 
We have to add adherence to a conference. We can come and listen to wisdom. You know, look what we heard today. So, are we calling you, please? And we we're thankful and grateful today that you all came out. And we hope that we'll continue to do that. Thank you all so much for coming. The night is not over yet. Okay? Thank you. I plan to get one of you. And to do the idea of the bagels. And I can't wait on the top, beans fryer on the bottom. Spring roll. School you go to and what you want to do. Those are the three things I'm going to eat from you. Okay? Alright, here we go. My name is Madra. School was in the first college. Hey! Don't say that one! We're going to change that one. Before your mother worries about what she's paying at Seneca College. You know. You know what you want. Didn't you hear all these things we know? You're thinking on the path of, there's no negativity. Um, uh-huh, she's thinking on the path of lawyer. So you know. You just maybe didn't want to say it out loud. Because that means we have to hold you accountable. Right? Accountability, we talked about it. So now there you go, honey. Pick one ticket. Make sure it's Diana's ticket. That's the one picking the ticket time. Let's <laughs> make so she picked the ticket, the ticket number, are you ready? 026-720-24. You won? Did we have, do we have a winner? So I'm gonna read 026, it's a blue ticket. 026-720. 2-4. You won. Please give her a big round of applause. That is the custom closet. Now, the next time you invite us home and we come upstairs, we better see that closet immaculate. You have sections. Don't be like me, just throw it in there. And then when it's time to look, you start going in there and digging. My poor husband, he's in the other room and it's supposed to be a walk-in. Huh. I walked all the way in and I took everything. Poor man, that's why I'm trying to get him the air fryer. Now you guys understand now, right? I took the closet, he needs the air fryer. Do we have a ticket for me? Anybody else? Come, sweetheart. Yeah, come, come, come. Come on, give her a big round of applause. She looked at me like, no, she's not. Now, you know why? Because it's her. <laughs> Inside joke. All right, but first, you have to tell me your name. Are you a student? What school you go to and what do you want to be? My name is Natalie. I go to University of Ottawa and I want to be a doctor. Ooh, I like that. Thank you, Natalie. Please draw for us. We have lawyers and doctors in the building. The future is bright. And that's your daughter. Oh, you see, you see, you see, Maude. She wants to put that one in there. When, you, when I was reading all your accolades, you didn't want me to. But now she's like, that's my daughter. <laughs> you see how proud we are? Proud women, good for you. It's another blue ticket. I know, right? And it is 026-720-54. I know. 4-5, I know. 026. Seven two zero five four. That's you. Come on now. This buffet set, and this is perfect for the type of business y'all do. They have a serious side hustle, and yeah, this is one more thing to add. Awesome. God bless you. Thank you so much. I said ticket to Blue Nipacho. This is the winning ticket. I said Blue Room and Evo. Okay. Come on down, sis. Come on. <laughs> so you have to tell me your name. Are you a student? What school are you going to? And what you want to be? Hey! Good for you, girl. She is in high school. 
and she wants to be a neurosurgeon. So anyone, we're not like here, do you see that? Doctors, lawyers, neurosurgeons, and because she's going for that, she was able to pick the only yellow one. God bless your heart, girl, because if another blue ticket came out, I was about to go home. I don't know how I would have answered to that. So this ticket, maybe your, wait, did your mom tell you to pick a yellow ticket? Because I, I know how, you know, strong-willed us mothers can be. Because every time I picked up a blue ticket, Juliet was like, oh. Now all of a sudden her daughter comes and picks a ticket and it's a yellow one? That's kind of suspect. But it's all good. It's all in the good fun. So the ticket number is 01631211. As long as Juliet didn't win, I'm okay. <laughs> One, two, one, one. Yes, come on down. Hey, yes, Raya. Yay, we are coming over. We are coming over. Hey. So, is this lady telling me I have to make chicken by myself tomorrow? Jeez. All right. So I got right here, neighbor. That's my husband's name. <laughs> I'm coming to make your chicken ice. So we can boogie. DJ Ice is on the ones and twos. But I am going to call the Zuminta ladies.
Yeah, yeah, yeah.